everyone. I'm Melody from Ag in the Classroom, and thank you so much for joining us um, this evening after a long Monday of teaching school. So I appreciate your willingness to learn about phonological and phonemic awareness around the farm. We are so excited um, to give you this new resource, and I am a uh, proud to introduce uh, my good friend, Kendra Shank. We've been uh, friends on the, the science of reading journey for a long time now, and she is a national letters trainer, and she knows so much about uh, phonological and phonemic awareness and just uh, reading in general. I know you guys are going to learn a lot um, from her. I recognize several names um, on the list. I'm excited to see people, um, so I'm not going to have my camera on. I'd, oh, no, I can turn it on. Uh, Oh, so I didn't have to come over here. Why didn't you say that? Oh, I forgot all about that. <laughs> we you figured that out last time. <laughs> Sorry, but here we go. So, uh, you know, if you know me, you know I'm not very good with technology. So uh, anyway, we are so excited. We will be mailing these out to you on Thursday. So um, I'll be putting those in the mail on Thursday. So you'll be getting your resources. And I know a few of you have your resources. So um, anyway, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kendra and she's going to get started. But I'm here to tell you guys, what you're going to get is like gold. It is, let me show it to you right offhand. This is the packet you're, you're going to get. It's all, sh it's got shrink wrap around it. It's called phonological and phonemic awareness around the farm. Look how thick this baby is. It's like a little over an inch thick. You get a multitude of activities in here and we're going to go through that. That one's yours now. So um, yeah, we're going to go through it today. So thank you again for working all day long and then coming in here in the afternoon afternoon. Um, I hope you learn a lot. Um, I'm sure you guys know a lot about um, some of the things we're talking about anyway, but um, if you have any questions at all, if you would just put them in the chat or unmute yourself and say, hey, wait a minute, Kendra, I've got a question. And we'll take it from there. So this is phonological and phonemic awareness around the farm. So we're going to start off with a quote about oral language. So I'm gonna give you a second to read this quote. So anytime I talk about oral language to any group of teachers, I always, I always start with this. If you are a pre-K teacher, you know that you get students that come, come to you ready to learn and they're right here. But you also get students that come to you down here that are not ready to learn. What is it about this gap in between them when neither group has ever had any in organized educational experience? Well, it's the oral language. They come either with a lot of oral language and a lot of vocabulary, or they come with little. So let's go on to this very next slide about oral language. And I know that this is phonological and phonemic awareness around the farm, but the very first component in your packet, it deals with oral language and how to develop that with your students. So you can see right here that it's, it's the foundation upon which literacy is developed. We know the students who live in language rich environments, who live with talkative parents, parents who converse with them, that not only talk to them, but talk back and forth with them. Those students come to us with a wide range of vocabulary, lots of oral language skills, and lots of words in their brain that they already are aware of. Those students that don't have that kind of background, they come to us with a lot less vocabulary. And that language, that, that interaction, that ability to know the words um, and recognize words they've heard, that is very important as the, as the foundational development for students who are hopefully going to become skilled readers. The phonics stuff. Oh. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at the packet. So this is, this is the front cover of the packet. And then you have a couple of um, pages with some, some um, directions, just some information about what the activities are like in, 
in the packet. The oral language cards, you're going to have a, 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 a sheet that looks like this for every activity that you have. These are thumbnail pictures of all the pictures within that activity, and they're labeled with what they um, what that picture represents. These are in orange. The ag pictures are in or orange, and those are the oral language cards. So here's an example of an oral language card right here, and it is in is you notice that it's got an orange um, border. It's also got an orange background on the on the left side, along with the information right here. So this is a picture of a combine, and I'm just going to read the information on the back of this card. The modern combine harvester or combine is a large machine designed to efficiently harvest many grain crops. The combine's name comes from the machine doing three separate parts of harvesting crops at one time, reaping, threshing, and winnowing. Reaping is cutting and collecting crops when they are ready for harvest. Threshing is separating parts of the crop, which can be eaten from, from, by people from the other parts. The winnowing is removing the parts of the crop which cannot be eaten by people called the chaff. Then keep the grain which can be eaten. That's the oral language information. That's building some background knowledge about what this picture is about. Then it has a couple of activities at the bottom. One is to have the students name one of the jobs of the com combine. The next one is a question. Is the tractor the same as a combine? Why or why not? So it lets you, it, it opens up activities or, or um, sentence starters or questions or something that they can name from the information you've given them. This is just information that Melody has come up with on this. Use your own background knowledge to enhance this, this information if you've got lots of background knowledge on that topic. Um, but it's, it's really good information right there. Another activity on, on the slide, you can see this information right here about these oral language cards. These, there are 18 of these cards. They, are, or, they have an orange back and an orange trim. These cards don't require cutting. So you can just, if they're going to be handled a lot um, by students, you're going to want to laminate them. It, it's pretty thick card stock, but you probably still want to laminate them if your students are going to be handling them. And then you can also use the picture on the front as a whole class writing prompt. One of the activities that, that we like is something called See, Think, Wonder. And you look at the picture and you have the students tell you, what do they see? Well, I see a combine in a wheat field. What do they think? I think this farmer is combining during the day because the picture has a bright sky, a light sky. And what do I wonder? Um, I wonder how long it's going to take the farmer to finish combining this field. So get the information from the see, think, wonder to generate some ideas for your whole class writing activity. And then you can put whatever you come up with on sentence strips, post this in the room someplace with those sentences underneath there. And then the students can refer back to that and maybe be talking and using some of that oral language that they got from the back of the card from when you introduced this concept to them. So that is the oral language portion of the packet. Next, we're going to talk about phonological and phonemic awareness. What are they and how are they different? I was telling August earlier, I started my journey into the science of reading nine years ago and it was my last year in the public school. And um, at that time with, with a master's, a reading specialist master's degree, at that time, I had never heard of the terms phonological and phonemic awareness. I didn't know they existed. And I know that I'm old as dirt, but somewhere along the way, that information should have trickled down to the classroom teachers, the people in the trenches that need to know this information in order to effectively and efficiently teach their students. And I never, I didn't even know it existed. So we're going to talk about phonological and phonemic awareness for just a little bit. Phonological awareness is this big umbrella. Um, 
it's anything having to do with phonological awareness. We're, t we're dealing with the sounds in words. It all has to do with the sounds. We never want to associate it with print. So it's all about the sounds, what we hear from the word. Um, and it is an important, as you can see on this slide, an important predictor and reliable predictor of later reading ability. You notice that there are four bullets at the bottom of this slide. Syllables, alliteration, onset rhyme, and phonemes. These are in order from um, easiest to more difficult concept. You notice that I, I said that it's a big, phonological awareness is a big umbrella. So you do have syllables, alliteration, onset rhyme, and phonemes. Phonemes is the very basic one. It's the, the smallest unit you can get to. A phoneme is the smallest speech sound in a word. And so if I have the word bat, b, at, b, is one of the speech sounds in that word. A ah is a phoneme in that word. T is a phoneme in that word. The word bat has three phonemes in it. And that's the smallest unit of speech within speech sound within a word. So now we're going to go into talking about phonemic awareness a little bit more. It is that a subset of phonological awareness and it's the ability to hear an individual sound in a word, to be able to identify it, to be able to blend it and segment it, and then eventually be able to manipulate it by either substitution, reversals, or deletion. Those activities are more advanced phonemic awareness activities, and you will not have any of those advanced phonemic awareness activities in your packet. We only deal with phonological awareness and then the basic phonemic awareness activities. Again, I've already said that it does not rely on print. So when we think of phonological and phonemic awareness, we think of the sounds in the words, only dealing with sounds in the words. And that's why we say it can be done in the dark. You can do it with your eyes closed. You can do <laughs> manipulatives, but you, you don't associate it with print. At some point, you can marry the two and be talking phon or phonemic awareness and phonics and pair them together. But to, to do true phon phonemic awareness activities, you will not do anything with print. So you will notice in your packet, the only place you will find any words are on the thumbprint pages. This got the little thumbprints of the um, pictures that are used and then in the in your directions and the oral language piece if there's words on it it's meant for the teachers and not the students on this next slide we have a a progression of phonological awareness from dr mary dogren um, she's here in oklahoma city she is um the trainer that um first first taught me about the science of reading and so we borrowed this this progression from her and it's like a stair step progression starting with the easiest and and stepping up to the more difficult so you see on the bottom three stairs on this slide that we do have syllables and alliteration and onset rhyme and then you notice where that arrow starts is this phoneme level that's when we jump to the phoneme level and we're talking about isolation. That's just the identification of a single phoneme in a word. And then we go to blending and segmenting. Those are the three skills you will be working with in this packet. Not actually um, segmenting, isolation. We really don't blend, do we? I don't think we have a blending thing. But those are the, the basic phonemic awareness activities. That top step that has the deletion, sub, substitution, and reversal, those are the more advanced um, phonemic awareness activities that are for students in grade levels above first grade. And you won't have activities for that. Here is another um, depiction of the levels of phonological awareness. This is ba based on the more recent work of Dr. David Kilpatrick. And you can see you've got the early phonological awareness skills right there on the top with those syllables, alliteration and onset rhyme. Then we move into the basic phonemic awareness skills, which is the phoneme blending and segmentation, and then the advanced skills that we won't be working with.
but there, it's important to know about those. So does anybody have any questions so far about anything I've said? If you've got um, any questions, go ahead and make sure you type in in the chat. Is that what you said? Oh, and where you teach, if you've not done that. Mary, or Mary, I don't know why I'm thinking Mary, I guess because we were talking about it a while ago. Melody is sitting over there and she's monitoring the chat. So if you have a question, she'll notice it and let me know. Okay, so we're going to start off with syllables. So how do you have your students identify syllables in the classroom? Put in the chat how, what you do to have students identify syllables. What do you do, August? I'm going to do a Jack Hartman Monkey the Geeks syllable song right now. Oh, okay. I don't see anything coming across yet. Clap and what, put up one finger for each syllable. That's how I did it, Carrie. I always clap syllables in my classroom. Hand under the chin. Clap out syllables and hand under chin. Okay. Earlier today, we had a couple of other ones. I can't really remember what they were. Put your face in your hands and count how many times your face goes up. Like this. Okay. And how many times your, your face goes up? Mrs. Walling, I use duck lips. Yay! So where are you from, Miss Walling? Duck lips is what I'm getting ready to teach everybody. So let me first share with you how I did it in my classroom. And um, if I went back to, to the classroom tomorrow, I'd want to be in second grade. Second grade is where my heart is. She is from Stewart Public School. Very good, Miss Walling. Okay, so um, in my classroom, I would have my students clap syllables. And if we're doing the word agriculture, this is what I would see with just a handful of my students. They would do this. Okay, what's my word? Agriculture. Let's clap those syllables. Ready? Agriculture. Agriculture. And you guys are smiling and nodding your heads because you've seen kids actually do this, right? Those students don't understand syllables. They don't, they don't get it. So let me show you the chin drop. So I want you to watch and see how many times my chin drops on this word. Wagon. Wagon. My chin really only dropped once, unless you say wagon, and then that's saying the word incorrectly. And we don't want students going around going the wagon and talking like that because they're not pronouncing words correctly. So even the chin drop is not accurate all the time, but duck lips is accurate 100% of the time, always without fail. So let me, let me advance the slide just a little bit. We're going to do duck lips. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to model it and then I'm going to have you guys do it with me. So we're going to still use the word duck or agriculture. I feel really bad because August is sitting right here and I never, I'm never even turning and looking at her because they're recording this. So um, it, they can put it on the website and teachers can still access the training. Um, so, okay, so sorry, sorry about that, August, over here. Um, so duck lipping agriculture. So what I do is I take one hand and I pinch with my forefinger and my thumb, I pinch my lips together, and with my other hand, I count. And what I'm doing when I pinch it, I'm going to say the word with my mouth closed, and I'm going to count every vibration I feel on my lips. That vibration is from the vowel sound in the syllable because we know you can't have a syllable if you don't have a vowel sound. Every syllable is, is, every syllable is dependent upon a vowel sound. So I'm going to do agriculture. Hmm, 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 hmm. Four syllables. 
it works perfectly every time. Let me tell you a little story that really sold me on this. And that's why I always teach duck lips. Anytime I talk to anybody about syllables, I teach duck lips. I was in a fifth grade classroom and I was modeling a lesson for the teacher. And I did, I was doing duck lips and we were talking syllables. And there was this fifth grade boy. And after three or four words, he said, oh, I get it. And I looked at the teacher and the teacher looked at me and we went right on. But when we got together on her plan time, she said, I had no idea Boston didn't know about syllables. And I said, well, of course you didn't. He's made it to the fifth grade and he's learned to fake his way through it. And what he learned to do was just to be a split second behind the students in the room that knew it to where his teacher thought he got it. You guys have students in your classroom the same way that do not understand it. And I, it was so eye-opening for me as a, as a fifth grader to know that he never understood how to figure out syllables until we did duck lips. So let me show you the counting. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is sign language for counting to 10. And so you probably will not need to do syllables with at words, words that have eight, nine or 10 syllables, but you might get a six or seven syllable word. And that's how you can, you can do that. Um, I've also had teachers that we would do multiplication and they clap with me and stay with me. And I say, how many syllables? And they go, because they couldn't count while they were clapping. So doing this, you've got something to count as the vibe, I mean, yes, to count, and that's the vibrations of the vowels, and you can count with your other hand. So now let's do it together with the word agriculture. Ready? Hmm, 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 hmm. Do you feel that vibration on your lips? Four vibrations, four syllables. And it works 100% of the time. Isn't it? Oh, I, I know. It, it's like, I can't wait to go back to school. Um, but I, I worked with a, a group of teachers once and I, I did a training with them on Monday. And then I was doing a second training with them on Thursday. And I had a kindergarten teacher come back on Thursday. And she said, I've just got to tell you, I did duck lips with my kindergartners Tuesday and Wednesday. And they loved it. And they got it. I thought they already had it, but now I know that they understand. And so her students were all about doing the duck lips. And if I can do it in front of a bunch of grownups and in front of a bunch of fifth grade boys, you guys can do it with your students. So now let's talk about the syllables and what's actually in your packet for syllables, will be in your packet for syllables. And um, I do see, Cheryl, you will receive your packet. They're not excuse me, they're not going to be mailed until after you get the training today. No, that's okay. I just, I just remember looking over there and seeing that she didn't have it. No, you're fine. You, you can, you've heard this now. This is what your fourth time to hear this. Oh, she's, she's doing the paperwork over there to make sure she gets all your, all the um, orders ready for tomorrow to, to mail off. She's going to get them ready for the mail tonight. Be ready. They will go out on Thursday. Yours will go out on Thursday because we've got more. We're at 29 now. Okay. yippee ki -yay. Okay, so talking about syllables. The easiest way to teach syllables for the youngest students are to talk about compound words first because the syllables represent real words in a compound word like hay stack. Those are two real words, and that makes sense to their ears. Hay, I know what hay is, stack. I know what stack means, put it together, and I have hay stack. So that's how we start with syllables. So let me show you this next slide. So we have compound words. Compound words are in blue. So the word compound words are right up here. Again, you have your thumbprints with what these words depict. Most of them are very obvious, but some of them, when Melody showed me the picture, I'm going, uh, yeah, I know what the egg is, but the, the yard one, I had trouble with it. Uh, house, I don't know, but it was yard. 
So though that information is on here for you, so you know exactly what the pictures are representing. So you have two words. You have bird and you have house and it makes birdhouse. So the students will get two words and these are light blue and then the compound word is dark blue. So they'll get two, they'll find the two words that make the compound word. And they gotta have, they have to have two light blue words to make one dark blue word from the back. Everything is color coded. So if you lose pieces after you cut them all up, you know exactly where they need to go, okay? So that's just one of the activities right there. That's for compound words. On the slide, you see we have barn and yard. And it, it, it put those two words together and we have barnyard. That's the picture I thought was a house when she first showed it to me. But I see it's got the yard right there in front of it. it. Makes perfect sense. And it'll make perfect sense to your students once you explain that to them. In the compound word par portion, you get 12 sets of compound words, 24 of the light blue picture cards, and 12 compound words that those picture cards, those 24 cards will then pair up to make a compound word. And you will have to cut those out. Really, the easiest way is to just get a Fisker's little paper crafting paper cutter and, um, and use that to cut them out. There's one activity that you'll have to use scissors, but there's a lot of cutting involved in this. But I would recommend that you laminate it first and then cut unless you have a laminator that that tends to peel off and then you may want to do the, the reverse. So our next syllable activity is the syllable puzzles and um, this is in yellow. You can see on this one, it says ag puzzles, but it's got the thumbnails right here with what those words are supposed to be representing. And then the one I pulled out of my packet was this one right here and it's garden. And you can see that that's not a straight line. And so these are the ones you're definitely gonna need a pair of scissors to cut. But the, the lines are pretty easy. They're not anything, Melody and I spent, spent an evening in New York outside of Niagara Falls cutting a bunch of stuff out that took us forever because it wasn't nice and neat like this. So um, yeah, this is garden. So my word is garden. So let's duck with that word. Mm -hmm. Two syllables, garden, garden, put it together and I have garden. Take that away, what do I have? Gar, put it back together, I have garden. Take this away, what do I have? Din, put it back together, what do I have? Garden. And so you have got on this activity, you've got 17 puzzles, the back of which are all yellow and they do require the cutting. And like I said, these will have to be with the scissors. Our next activity is the syllable sorting. It's done in purple. The syllable sorting words right here are important in purple with the thumbnail pictures and what those pictures represent. Then you have four sorting mats and they're all red barns. This one has number one, this one has number two, number three, and number four, because we have up to four words with up to four syllables. So the students would then lay these down on, after you've explained this and gone over this with the students, then they lay the mats down at the workstation. And then they find a word like um, animals. Here's the picture of the animals and they duck lip it. Okay, we got to find out how many syllables. Hmm, hmm, hmm animals, three syllables. So I'm gonna put my picture on, of the animals on the barn with the number three. Mm. On the slide, we have pecans and we have tractor. Some of you may have thought that was nuts. It is perfectly okay if your students call them nuts. We don't care. If they, if they call, I'm trying to think what's in um, tractor. 
there, there's really nothing different on you would think that that tractor is. But if your students think the picture is something different in this exercise, it is perfectly okay to do that because that's just generating some more oral language. Oh, these are pecans. Oh, well, I was going to call them nuts. Well, really, they're the same thing. We can call them both and it's okay. So where are we going to put it? Are we going to put it? Well, how many, how many um, syllables are in nuts? Well, I don't know. Let me, and they're going to talk their way through this if it's in a workstation. So that is the syllable sorting activity. And you come with the four syllable mats with the barns with the numbers on them. You have 18 picture cards. They're all purple on the back, even the barns and then the picture cards. Again, brilliant idea on Melody's part um, to, to think of color coding everything that way. So any questions about the syllables so far? Okay. Okay. So you will be able to see the lines a little bit on the picture and put the picture back together so we did put the line on the front. So yes, you can see great picture, Casey, are the lines on there. So let me hold this up. I think, can you see that little white line going down the middle of that? That's the line that you're gonna cut on. And all the pictures will have, they're not all the same shape. They're, they're different ones. And so your pictures will have those white lines for you to cut on. Excellent question. I'm glad you like the duck lip, Sherry. It, it, I'm telling you, it, it's, a, it's another one of those game changers. So now we're going to talk about onset rhyme. You remember that onset rhyme that was, we started with syllables, we went to alliteration, onset rhyme, alliteration, we're really not working at, working with that concept in the packet, but we're going on to onset rhyme. So again, and you know, I, I say this, I, I let teachers know that when I started my, my um, journey with the science of reading, what I was unaware of, I had never heard of onset rhyme before as a second grade teacher. I, I, I didn't know what it was. Nobody ever, I didn't learn it in college. None of my programs used it. So therefore I didn't know it. And you think maybe, oh, she's probably not a very good teacher. I really was considered a pretty good teacher, but I found out in, the, in my journey with the science of reading, what I did not know. And I, I have since found out and realized that, that what I didn't know was crucial, critical information for my students. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can get on the science of reading journey. So let's talk about onset rhyme. So some of you probably know what onset rhyme is. Some of you may not. So I'm going to address it just in case there are those of you who were like me and had never heard that before. So onset is everything from the beginning of the word to the first vowel in that word. Your rhyme, R-I-M-E, is from that first vowel to the end of the word. So if I have the word farm, my word is farm. My onset is and my rhyme is arm because everything to the first vowel is the onset from the first vowel to the end of the word is a rhyme. So now I have the word charm, charm. So my onset is ch and my rhyme is arm. What if I have the word arm? I don't have an onset. I only have a rhyme, arm. You can have a rhyme and no onset, but you cannot have an onset without a rhyme because there's no word in our language that is, it consists of only one consonant or a group of just consonants. They have to have a vowel. This rhyme, R-I-M-E, from the vowel to the end of the word is where R-H-Y-M-E comes in, the rhyming. It's because of the R-I-M-E. We think of them as chunks. We think of them as word families. We think of them however your program calls it, whatever they call it. But from the, the first vowel to the end of the word is the part that you use to rhyme, find words that will rhyme with it. 
So that leads us in to the rhyming portion of the packet. Again, you have your rhyming page that's got your thumbnails with what pictures these are representing. This is in red. You can see the red right up there. You have a rhyming mat right here. It's got rhyming written in red. It's got a, a um, red border and it's got a red background. And then on the slide, you see that I've got a picture of brick and bricks and you, I've got a picture of a chick. So brick and chick. So those are rhyming words. And the students will find those and then lay them on the rhyming mat. Here are two more pictures. I have dog and I have frog and I can pair those up and lay them on the rhyming mat because those two words rhyme. In this part of your packet, you will have that one rhyming mat. You have 10 sets of rhyming pictures. They all have a red back and they do require cutting. So any questions so far about um, syllables or onset rhyme and rhyming? We really don't have an onset rhyme activity. It leads us into the rhyming portion. Okay, so now we're going to go in, and that was all under the um, basic phonological awareness category. Now we're going into the, I mean, the early phonological awareness um, skills. Now we're going into the basic phonemic awareness skills. Phoneme isolation is, which is just the identification of a, of a phoneme in a word. It's a pretty broad category because you can talk about the initial sound, you can talk about the final sound, or you can talk about that medial sound. This is written in this order because initial sounds are the easiest ones for students to be able to identify in a word. That initial sound. What, does, what sound does that word begin with? What's the beginning sound? What's the first sound? However you word it, that first sound is the easiest one for them to hear. The next, once they master initial sounds, then you go to final sounds because that's the next easiest one for them to master. Once they've mastered final sounds, then you go to the medial. Medial sounds are the hardest ones for students to hear. They get kind of lost between that first and that initial and final sound. So it's really harder for some students to identify that medial sound. So some activities you can do with this is say, what is the initial sound in the word, whatever. Um, which final sound do these words have in common? Asking those kinds of questions. I have to look at my notes right here. So some of you will remember on um, Sesame Street, they had something like that went like, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. On Sesame Street, they did that with vocabulary, but you can do it with initial, final, and medial sounds. We're only going to deal with initial sounds in the packet, okay? So in the next one, you've got, on the slide is called phoneme isolation, but it's actually in your packet called phoneme matching, and it's in green. Again, you've got your thumbnail pictures with what words that they represent. You have your phony matching um, mat and it's got a green border and a green background. And then you've got phony matching cards. So you notice on this slide, we I put on the windmill and the watermelon. Doesn't matter that those words are really long they can figure out what the beginning sound is in windmill and watermelon. They can, they can tell that those two, sound, those two words begin with the same sound. I've also pulled out barn and butter. They both begin with the b sound, b, barn, butter. 
I am so glad that Melody included pictures like this. I have chickens. I have cheese. What's my beginning sound? Ch. They both begin with the letter C, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sound. So I'm really glad there's digraphs in here because ch is a sound. And mm -hmm. cheese and chickens both begin with that ch sound. Now I want to, let me go on to this next slide. I, I want to show you, um, I keep saying Melody did this and Melody did this. This is Melody's baby. She is the one who came up with this idea. She, she bounced ideas off of me. She told me how it was going. She did this. She showed me the pictures every step along the way. I'm seeing all of this because we, we do spend a lot of time together. We are colleagues and we've done a lot of the same trainings and different things. I actually helped her edit these and make any revisions that needed to be and try to find any mistakes but there's one that slipped by us. And if we're matching phonemes, that must mean that if I have a barn, I'm an, an initial phonemes, then I'm gonna have another word that starts with the b sound, right? Well, you get all the way down here to farmer. Here's the farmer. And there's not another picture on in this set that begins with the sound. So, I mean, and it just like jumped out at me when we were cutting these up for, we were cutting them up for ag in the classroom conference, weren't we? And I said, oh my goodness, there's not another F word. And of course we had to laugh about the F word, but we realized that. So we decided, because, you know, I'm doing this presentation the next day at the ag in the classroom con um, conference, and these have already been printed. I mean, they've printed 500 copies of this. So what are we going to do? We got to figure something out. So we decided because of that picture, and let me show it to you up close again, that really looks, could be a gardener because she's standing by what looks to be a garden and holding an ear of corn. So you can make her be a gardener instead of a farmer, or you can pair farmer and sunflower and rooster and butter because they've got the same ending sounds, that er sound. Or you could take butter and birdhouse and barn and farmer and say, which one of these don't belong? It could be your odd one out. So that gives you three ways that you can still use the farmer picture because it's a pretty good picture. We don't wanna leave any of these pictures out because who, who was it that did the pictures? Whitney Wilkinson from her from Melody's division here at the Department of Ag came up with these pictures and the pictures are awesome. They they are phenomenal. So that just gives you a way to Oops, use that make a mistake wearing the wrong concealer. You can't try concealers on in store shade matching. Online. So you notice on this slide, I've got the words wheat and wheelbarrow wheelbarrow. So I'm going to talk about this because on one of the deals, I did have windmill and watermelon. That was on the slide. So in, if you have ever um, ventured into letters training or the science of reading, and some of you may already be um, registered to do that letters training, you will hear this um, in unit two, actually, that um, in the English language, the, dub, the sound that WH represents is slow, it's not slowly leaving, it's almost gone from our language. And um, when I heard that, I'm sitting here going, hmm, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I'm not gonna argue with Dr. Mary Dahlgren, but I don't, I don't believe that because or I- Louisa Or Louisa Motes, even more importantly, the author of it. Um, I, I'm not going to stand up and say that, and, but Melody and I have gotten into this conversation several times, especially with several groups. As a teacher and as a learner, I never understood why people thought that these two words were homonyms. The witch that flies at Halloween and which one do you want? Because they're different to me. This is a witch.
which one do you want? Blue or green? Which? Which? I say the WH sound. But Melody does not. And Melody is with the majority and I'm with the minority. And you guys are all sitting there going, which? Which? Because I saw Allison doing it. <laughs> You're yeah, saying yeah. these words to figure out. But Allison I. Oh, like, Alan. Oh, that. yes. The Wheat Thins commercial. That is. <laughs> the wheat, if you've never seen the Wheat Thins commercial, it's from Family Guy. You need to you need to do a YouTube search of the Wheat Thins commercial. It's hysterical because the guy just over in the wheat thins, wheat thins, and just really blows up his face to say that WH sound. And I don't do that, but I don't say wheat thins. I see, I can't say that wheat. <laughs> it's hard for me to say it wheat because my husband's not a wheat farmer, my husband is a wheat farmer because <laughs> I say the WH but the point in this is you're going to have students in your room some in one one camp and some in the other camp and it needs to be addressed because even though that sound is almost eliminated from our language we do not change the spelling of the words wheat will never be spelled w-e-h a T. It will never change. Just like the, the silent letter K in words and G in words, that K and that G are originally, when those words came to our language, language from the Anglo Saxon influence, those letters were pronounced. They were very guttural and in the throat, blah, you know, type sound. We don't say those sounds. We have Americanized them. We have become more efficient. I say lazy or melody says more efficient with what our mouths are doing. And so, but we still retain the K N and G N spelling and we will always retain the W H spelling. And then those oldies, but goodies like me that say the W H sound, we're going to stick, stick it out. So just, just remember, you're going to have students that may want to argue with you on that. And both, both melody he is right and I'm right. We're both right. She thinks she's right more than I am, but that's okay. That's beside the point. No, I really don't think that I'm right more than she is. I just think that the majority of Americans have gone away from saying that sound. It's not that it's right or wrong, it's just that there are fewer and fewer people like Kinder. It's just, it's a shift. It's just it a is shift a shift. In our pronunciation. And so there have been other shifts in pronunciation through um, our language so it's just a shift. and I'm having to concede because the more teachers I train the more I realize that she's actually right and I'm actually wrong and but I'm I you know that's between us I'm never going to admit that to her okay so in the phoneme isolation or the phoneme matching this is what you have you have that phoneme matching mat Matt, you have 36 picture cards. They all have that light green background on them right here. And it does require cutting. This is, have there been any questions at all? Not yet. Okay. So now we're going to go into, hang on, I got to have a drink. We're going to go into the phoneme segmentation piece. So when I presented this for Melody at the Ag in the Classroom conference this summer, there was a teacher that said, and I'm so glad she did. She said, I, uh, our program has those Elkonin box, but I, I just didn't know how to use them. So I'm going to show you how to use Elkonin boxes. And I have my handy dandy board. And what this actually is, is a magnetic calendar from Walmart, cheap, cheap. I took duct tape, cut it in half and covered the days of the week. And now I have a phoneme graphing board or, or an Alconan box board that's magnetic. So I am going to do, I'm trying to, to move this to where you can see this. So we're going to do the word barn. So first we're going to see how many sounds do we have in barn? Can you see this all right? Okay. So first we're going to see how many words we, or how many sounds we have in barn. B, R, 
Mountain Barn. Three sounds. So I need three chips. So I'm going to put my chips under that first row. Now, it's real important when you have your students do this, that they're pushing and saying the sound. First sound is B. Second sound is R. Third sound is N. What's my word? Barn. Anytime you break a word up into sounds, always pull it back together and segment it back together. So uh, let's see, let's do pond, pond. So let's tap out the sounds in pond. P -a -n -d, pond, four sounds. So I need, whoa, doggies, I need four chips. First sound, second sound, ah, third sound, n, fourth sound, d, pond. And your students, you'll have, you'll get to where you can stop. You, you don't have to say, what's the word? You just run your finger underneath it and they, they're able to do it. So that is, that's how you use Elkonen boxes. A step further is when you actually start using print with this. And remember I said that it gets to the point that you can do some phonological phonemic awareness activities and associate it with print. This is a real good thing to do with spelling once they get to spelling. And then what you would do is you'd say, okay, what was that first sound? How would you write that? And then they write a P. What's the second sound? Ah, oh, how would you write that? O, oh, and they write the letter O. Third sound, N, how would you write that? N, and you so write it. Last sound, D, how would you write that? D, good, write it. And then they're learning to spell the words. But for this activity, we never associate print with it. So this leads us into the next activity and you will need small objects to segment the words, you can use chips, you can use um, um, math manipulatives, you can get a round circle punch at Hobby Lobby, I mean, in the paper crafting department or at Walmart and just punch out a bunch of construction paper. And then you, you don't have anything like a magnet or a math manipulative that they're losing all the time. So now on this, you have, again, and this is done in dark green, you have the phoneme counting, which has the thumbnails with, of the pictures. And then we have two, three, four, and five phoneme words. Here's the examples right here. So we've got example of hay, a, hay, goat, g, o, t, goat. On these cards, and, and these are actual pictures of the cards, there's only the, the number of boxes that there, the number of boxes equal the number of sounds in the word. So you can't go wrong with this. If you don't know what those sounds are um, and you have trouble with this, let Melody know because she'll, she'll oh, you can do that. She, she, she will she'll be able to help you out because the teachers that are unfamiliar with how to do this, usually the, usually what trips them up is they try to make the number of letters equal the number of sounds. And, and that doesn't, that sometimes that's a one-to-one -one match like in pond, but in pie, that is not a one-to-one -one match. Pie is a three letter word but there's only two sounds, P I, pie. So here's the picture of the pie. This one right here is soil. And so it'd be s, oi, o. And actually, were you not gonna type these up? I'm doing it right now. Oh, she's doing it right now. We talked about doing this after Ag in the Classroom conference. This is a picture of fruit. So that U-I together represents that long U sound. And then this is peaches. P-E-C-H-E-Z. 
And so each, each box represents a sound. You have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of phonemes and the graphemes. Phonemes are the sounds in the words. The graphemes are the letters or letter combinations that represent those sounds. Letters are something completely different. So in this word, silo, S-I-L-O, silo. I have four sounds, four phonemes, I have four graphemes, and I have four letters. But in the word turkey, t -er -k -e, turkey, I have four sounds or phonemes, I have four graphemes, but I have six letters because the U-R represents the er sound and the E-Y represents the long E sound at the end of the word. So any questions about that? In this part of the packet, you have 30 cards. This is my favorite part of the packet. You've got 30 cards. They're all, they all have this dark green background. You don't have to cut anything on there, but it does require some kind of manipulative chips or coins or pieces of paper or something. It requires them to move something. The key thing is to always ensure that as they're pushing it up into the box, they're saying the sound. It's that movement, that hand eye. I'm, sa I'm hearing it, I'm saying it, I'm pushing it. It all helps it Velcro in the brain that much better. All of the activities you guys have, have um, encountered so far in, or, well, today in the presentation are all, it's all wordplay. And students love to do wordplay. That's why they like the sing songs, you know, those rhyming songs and, and the, um, the Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers things and the ones who can do pig Latin and I have never been able to do pig Latin. So if you are somebody that is really good at speaking pig Latin, you have got a really good phonological processor in your brain. I, I can't do that, but it's fun to do. Wordplay is fun with students. And the whole thing about it is they're learning something so important why they think they're just playing. They don't think they're learning. They're doing it with pictures and, and manipulatives and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it, it's, it's fun stuff to do. And they love to play with words and they like listening to the sounds because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, how ready they are for, for reading to listen to the sounds of words. Hearing all these sounds in these words will make them more prepared to become skilled and fluent readers. So I want to thank you for joining me today. I really, we really appreciate this.